Hello, listeners, and welcome to the latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast with me, Chris Holiday, And me, Alex Sargent. So for this episode, we are turning to 1920s Germany, uh, and particularly a 1920s uh, German animated fairy tale by uh, an animation pioneer uh, and filmmaker, Lottie Reiniger. But we aren't going to do it right now. We've, We've done actually it. We've actually done it. already done it. We have. Let, let me explain. This is um, the first of a series of live episodes you'll be hearing on our podcast uh, stream throughout the year um, as we give you um, an insight into our screening series at the London uh, Cinema Museum. If people don't know, every month we run a screening series where Chris and I um, curate a, a film, we put a film on for people to watch, uh, we invite a special guest often um, and we record um, a few live podcasts. We've been doing that since about September of 2019. So this is the one we did back in October, October 2019 yeah. um, with our very, very special guest, uh, Carolyn Ruddle. Yep, so Carolyn uh, is an expert in uh, Reiniger. Is kind of, she works at Brunel University in London in the uh, film and television department, um, but she writes extensively on Reiniger, is interested in Reiniger, is conducting a kind of project on craft and craft-based animation. Um, and so we felt that she was a really interesting person to come and talk to us uh, and the people at the Cinema Museum about Reiniger, um, connecting up her work to issues of craft, um, of fairy tales, uh, and also the kind of German 1920s context. She's also one of our authors in our edited collection, Fantasy Animation Connections Between Media, Mediums and Genres, where she has a chapter uh, on Reiniger uh, and her relationship to the Weimar um, context in which she was working. So if people don't know um, this film, because yeah. um, if you'd have been there in October, we'd have explained all this, well, Carolyn would have explained all this to the audience prior to the screening, but um, Prince Ahmed is nominally... Um, well, certainly the oldest surviving animated feature in existence. Yeah. Um, it was made in... 26. So, in fact, it was made, as Caroline explained, it's it's one of those films, because it is a silhouette animation, it uses this sort of silhouette animation technique um, involving cutouts, um, jointed cutouts that are then lit from behind. It was quite an arduous process, and she describes that this film... Um, kind of came to fruition over a number of years um, and was, then was finally released in, in 1926. Um, and one of the, uh, I think the, the print that we showed was um, colour tinted, which was exciting. Um, the film has been celebrated, as Alex said, it's one of the, the if, if not the, um, uh, kind of one of the early pioneering films of the 20s, one of the surviving movies of the It's 20s. the oldest surviving, right? So there were a yeah. few others. Um, I think Caroline might explain this. I can't remember if Caroline explains this. It was back in October, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I can't rem remember. But um, uh, I, if it... There are a few older animation features that we know existed. I think they were made in Argentina. Yes, yes. Um, but they're now lost. So this is doing its job as the oldest surviving animation And 11 film. years before Snow White, so there we yeah, go. Yeah, so, so take that, Disney. Um, it's silhouette, um, yep. and from my perspective, it's great because it's an adaptation of a fairy tale, and, and often, um, and not a, sort of, not a European fairy tale, but one of the um, 1001 uh, Nights, the yep. Arabian, or often called the Arabian Nights tales. Um, actually, a collection of them sort of um, botched together into one grand narrative. So it's really interesting in that respect, too. Um, and what you're about to hear is us uh, on stage with Carolyn, talking about um, the film uh, through various angles. Um, we'll let you listen to that. And then after a, a bit of us trying doing our usual podcast, uh, podcasting live, <laughs> uh, we open it up to a QA. and a You'll hear members of the audience taking part in asking us some questions and taking parts in the conversation. Um, and actually, we're lucky enough to be joined on the night by a couple of um, animation scholars. Yeah. So you'll hear me reference um, the fact that there's a few people sitting around us who know, so, so who know like, perhaps yeah. more. Can you imagine know more about this sort of stuff than we do? You'll hear two some, people hear some, sitting here yeah, exactly. googling things live. Exactly. So the people that we would normally look up are uh, were sitting in the room, and as mm. I make, as you will hear, a hilarious gag on the podcast. Uh, you should always cite your sources. So there's lots of point. You won't be able to see it, but yes. you will hear us effectively point at members of the uh, of the crowd. But it was also, you know, it was a packed crowd um, down there. Were very grateful for the number of people who came. So there was also members of the public who who asked some questions. You'll hear that, um, and uh, we had, a, I think, really interesting conversation about all kinds of things. So we, I will, we did. I will let you all be the judge of that. Um, Chris and I obviously are now going to make a lovely cup of tea and sit back and listen to it all again because that's all we do in our spare time. Um, so we'll see you in about, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes. Yep, yep. Just meet back. 
Okay, thank you everybody for sticking around for this uh, Q&A and uh, live uh, podcast recording. There'll be a roaming mic later on, so um, we'll leave space at the end for, for sort of questions. Uh, as we said in the introduction, um, I work in animation largely, uh, and Alex is a sort of history, um, is interested in the history and theory of fantasy, and so it's a real pleasure for us to kind of come together and talk about uh, The Adventures of Prince Archimed, a film that we thought about recording for the podcast for a while, and it's something that I think we wanted to do uh, and we sort of held out and held out uh, because we wanted to involve, involve Caroline. So this seems a really good chance uh, to talk to her a little bit about how she came to the film, uh, some of the work that she's done, and then we sort of gave, in our email exchanges beforehand, a sort of uh, rundown of key areas that we might touch on. So I know that Caroline's very interested in kind of craft and the handmade, um, and this bigger question perhaps of where we place and situate and cite uh, Reiniger, uh, and it's great that there are so many, I know, kind of fans of Reiniger and, and um, animation uh, scholars in the room as well, um, people that research Reiniger, so hopefully once we've spoken to Caroline for, for a bit and, and got her thoughts on the film, we can open it out for questions, and so we'd really like to hear your thoughts on the screening, of course, uh, and if there's anything that you'd like to, to kind of pose to us. Um, but to kick things off, uh, I, I know Caroline's work um, and I kind of came to, and I know the kind of stuff that she writes on, and so I'm interested in how she came to Reiniger, and particularly this film, uh, uh, as a kind of focus for her. She's written on doppelgangers, um, but I know her largely through her work on animation. So I guess as a sort of starter for Ten, I'm really interested in where you uh, were kind of coming from for the. How did you how did you discover um, Reiniger and ultimately this this film? Okay, thank you. Is that working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a funny story because I have a very sort of classic film studies background, uh, really. Um, and I, uh, the first book that I wrote was about doppelgangers, as as Chris has just uh, alluded to. Uh, so I was very interested in um, kind of identity and uh, shadow selves on screen and what's kind of going on there. Uh, and I think sort of shortly after I'd finished that. Um, I read uh, Esther Leslie's um, is it Flatlands? Flatlands, Hollywood Flatlands, yeah. yeah. Uh, and she was writing about Reiniger, and it sort of it sparked a memory of seeing um, I'd seen some still images uh, of Reiniger's stuff, um, and I just I, 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 this is a slightly odd link, I suppose, but. I, there, so there were two things I was I was interested in kind of shadow selves on screen, and this is a very different kind of shadow world to the, the sort of the doppelganger stuff I was looking at, which is all about doubles and split identities and that kind of thing. But, but something in my mind uh, sort of went there. Um, and I really like Esther Leslie's stuff uh, generally and her writing about Reiniger. I, I just became very interested about this question of 1923 and um, uh, I was sort of looking at animation anyway and just this idea that sort of something that's seen as a bit trivial, I think, uh, and I say that's obviously highly problematic, um, but, you know, cartoons and animation is often seen as sort of fairly lightweight and trivial or children's stuff, um, and and this film just, just strikes me as very important, so I've spent quite a long time uh, sort of since then trying to, to work through some of those, some of those issues, uh, because I think it's a very important film for lots of reasons. It's very important because of her. Lottie Reinig is a very important figure in our um, animated history uh, and our film history, and I don't think she's been given the uh, sort of uh, her, her dues as she should have been and, and lots of people write about her and say oh isn't she fantastic um, and then that's kind of it uh, so she's sort of like a footnote or a, a yeah. bullet point or a, a thing that happened yeah. in that period and then we went on to Disney. Is that, yes, is that the exactly. narrative? Exactly, yeah. I think that's it. So, you know, it's, it, there is a reason why, um, you know, people often think Snow White is the first animated film. There's a reason why people think Disney, uh, lots of people think Disney invented the multi playing camera. Um, Chris Pallant sat at the back there, acknowledges Lottie Reiniger in his book. So that's one of the few sources that actually do, does do that um, because she was very pioneering um, and because of how she was working, you know, in a very independent kind of fashion, um, you know, she's not really been given her dues that she should have been. You said, um, honestly, there is a reason why. What, what is that reason, do you think, then, that she hasn't been given the acknowledgement that she deserves? Is it to do with her subject matter, or is it to do with sort of her place in history? Um, I wondered if you could say more about that. Yeah, it's, it's to do with a number of things. Um, one is the fact that she's a woman working outside of the uh, the mainstream kind of industry. So generally, 
again, I mean, Bella's sitting over there. She could say a lot more about this. This is great. This is like, like it's like physical a, yeah. referencing. This Hello. is good. Um. <laughs> but, you know, women are often... You should always cite your sources. Yeah. Yeah. One there <laughs> and one there. You can see yeah. them. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're in the room. Um, yeah, you know, there, 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 is, there is sort of some tradition of women in animation working outside of the industry, sort of in more kind of, you know, artisanal practices. And I think Reiniger has been part of that kind of tradition. Um, so, you know, Paul Wells writes quite problematically about her in terms of sort of, you know, stuff to do with a feminine aesthetic, uh, which is a quite difficult and problematic um, term. Um, so I think there's that. I think the fact that she does fairy tales... Um, which was very much uh, aligned with children's culture. Um, so what's really interesting about the silhouette format is that it started out as portraits. Before there was photography, before anything like that existed, people used silhouettes uh, to, uh, and I'm sure you've seen examples of this, to create the silhouettes of people uh, as, as, as a form of portraiture. Uh, but it then, once photography became um, you know, much more standard in terms of documenting the, you know, the indexical reel, silhouette stuff moves into kind of the realm of children's culture and fairy tale uh, and is, is, is largely taken less seriously. Um, so if you look back at sort of trade press stuff on Lottie Reiniger's work, it's, it's you know, what's played up uh, is uh, sort of the fairy tale qualities um, that it's kind of children's stuff that she is in some way herself kind of magic or or, or wizard you know somehow magic to these films out of nowhere. She's not really taken that seriously as a sort of technical pioneer, which is what she was. Um, yeah. So, because well, well, I was just thinking then, given the, the centrality of, of fantasy and fairy tales, I guess I have a question for Alex, which is really, does Lottie Reiniger appear... I mean, we talk about lots of figures that traverse these categories or these, these dual histories or these uh, root and branch histories of fantasy and animation, which obviously we're trying to suggest um, or think about as a lot more knotted. And so I wondered whether, given what Caroline's saying in terms of the centrality and the focus on, on fairy tale and the fact that she's often positioned in this 20s period as some, somebody in animation history that that happened and this was a thing and the film was released and this was wonderful and then Disney came along and sort of did loads and loads of exciting things. Um, does Reiniger appear in histories of fantasy film, fantasy cinema? Is she similarly occluded or marginalised? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think she, she does appear, but I think she's part of a sort of broader problem in fantasy writing, which is we often take animation as the tool to make the to make the fantasy come to life. So animation often isn't given the sort of artistic or imaginative credit it often deserves. These animators are rarely sort of seen as um, fantasists in their own right, but as people or sort of artisans that bring another vision to life. So she's very much seen as a sort of an adapter of folk stories and, and a pioneering adapter. But a, um, and it's interesting you were saying that her technical um, sort of um, expertise is often played down because actually I would argue that probably isn't true in fantasy um, uh, scholarship or, or fantasy history. It's often that's played up, if anything. But I wanted to sort of um, actually draw on what you're saying about sort of children's literature and this idea of, 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 of folk story and linking to Reiniger's gender. In that, uh, that, and I think it's um, Marina Warner who makes this point. Um, folk stories are as much a sort of women's literature as they're much as they are coded as children's literature very often the, the household tale the um the domestic sphere in which folk stories are engaged with so i find it fascinating that um that someone so engaged in sort of left-wing politics and the avant-garde in the 20s would would find folk stories a useful vehicle for expression um do we know a little bit more about sort of why she she turned to to of all things a sort of you know uh, an oral history, the the the, um, the a thousand and one nights of all the sort of things for inspiration, and mm -hmm. and what the sort of political act she was trying to commit um, during that period was, if any. Um, yeah, there's there's a there's some number of interesting points <laughs> in there. So one thing I would say is that Reiniger, to my knowledge, uh, was never um, overtly political about anything. Um, the 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 one kind of main political act she she did do was leave Germany. Um, during the rise of, of, of the Nazis. Uh, and, and that was because she, her and her husband did that of solidarity for Jewish friends. They were not themselves being persecuted. So that's the one kind of political act that, she, if you can call it a political mm -hmm. act. Um, otherwise, she's very kind of depoliticized, uh, which, again, I find really interesting. Um, 
But to, to come to your point about fairy tale and folklore, uh, and yes, and there is a, obviously a, a huge tradition of women reclaiming that. Uh, uh, um, Marina Warner is key, as was Angela Carter, um, although Angela Carter also came up against some mm -hmm. criticism uh, in terms of how she approached her sort of reappropriation of fairy tale. Um, I think what I'd say about Reiniger is that she she doesn't seem to be doing anything of that description. Uh, so I'm sure you'll you know you'll be aware watching the film that um, it's quite problematic in its representation of many identities. I've got um, race question mark yeah, written yeah. on my notes. <laughs> yeah. um, we might get to that in a second. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, Yes, I don't think she was doing anything overtly political with the form of fairy tale as a kind of form of women's expression in the way that other people have done. Um, and yeah, she was, she was, I've never read anything um, that suggests that she was uh, particularly overtly political about anything, which, which is which is interesting and I find problematic because it feeds into the narrative of her kind of doing sort of trivial stuff while her male collaborators are doing this important avant-garde political um, work. Um, so that that's a big question, yeah, which I'm not sure I have a particularly decent answer to, but it's something that, yeah, is a... It's a big question mark over her, I think. I mean, I was going to say, because you mentioned the artisanal, and, and obviously I know that you've, you've, or you're interested in craft and handmade. Is, so some of that triviality, because I think obviously, you know, we've, we've seen how ornate this work is. Um, and so is, it, is this, is part of the triviality then her, these, these sort of quote unquote industrial or these personal processes in which she is um, coded and framed within a particular kind of uh, workspace? Uh, and ultimately the resulting kind of pretty work. Um, so I've heard you speak previously about criticisms or, or, yeah. or Reiniger's connection to these kinds of categories, craft, handmade, and this pretty feminine aesthetic. Is that where the triviality kind of comes in? Yes, uh, and, uh, and I do stress that that's deeply problematic. Um, so... It's a very kind way of saying it. I think it's a very <laughs> academic way of saying it. Deeply problematic. Yeah. It's Unpacked. stupid. Yeah. It's <laughs> Yeah, so one of the, th I guess the other thing that, in to come back to your very first question, the other thing that interested me about Reiniger is that, is that I'm, I'm very interested in handmade work. Um, and that's because it's gendered, essentially. Uh, so craft-based work has been gendered for a long time uh, since we had a rather strange division between the arts and the crafts. And arts kind of ended up as this sort of uh, realm of uh, male genius and crafts were often aligned. And this is not my argument, this is been argued by many people uh, before me. Um, crafts became aligned with uh, women, with domesticity, uh, things that you can do in the home, with tools that you have at your uh, disposal. And Reiniger fits very much into that uh, kind of category. So she was she often uh, spoke uh, or um, did workshops on how to make your own um, uh, silhouette films. And she would say, you know, all you need is your kitchen table and your kitchen scissors, and this, this, this sort of emphasis on, um, yeah, sort of domestic, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, again, to cite Bella, I mean, Bella's been looking at this in more detail, and kind of uh, women, women's kind of labor, uh, and where women work, and where they kind of fit work in, uh, and often working outside of the mainstream, um, and that, that's that got all kinds of questions uh, attached to it. Um, so, yeah, Reiniger is interesting uh, in that respect. I would say that lately, uh, interestingly, craft is probably held up uh, as very important. Um, so we, we, I think, you know, to kind of, this is kind of broad strokes, but there's been a sort of a bit of a kind of backlash against things like CGI and uh, computer generated imagery and there's there's sort of a little bit of a, um, a holding up of craft as sort of authentic and, and that, that's also very <laughs> problematic um, but yeah so those kind of boundaries have shifted I think in quite uh, interesting ways but to come back to your point about the pretty yes so um, Reiniger's work is obviously very uh, ornamental uh, as you've seen um, uh, and so some of the work I've done is is looking at that kind of aesthetic, because what's happened with Reiniger, and this is one of the problems with uh, how people have approached her work, is they've become completely waylaid by how her work looks, because it is so arresting. It's very ornamental, uh, it's very unique, um, uh, and it is very beautiful to look at. So it, what's kind of been ignored is her kind of context and 
the other stuff that's going on around her work uh, and what comes out very, very clearly in the, the kind of particularly the trade press around her work is that it's pretty. Uh, it's, it's pretty work. And that leads us into a whole kind of uh, very difficult area. Um, so, I, I mean, I would follow Rosalind Gout's argument that the idea of the pretty aesthetic is a deeply gendered one. Uh, and it's also about cultural value, uh, where we lessen, we have less value attached to work that is deemed to be kind of pretty uh, and feminine uh, and apolitical. And just to be clear, so these are criticisms of her work that are happening at the time and... Implied. Implied. Mm. Um, and are still largely upheld today because there seems to be... No. I wouldn't say that there's some sort of full, full way kind of recovery of her work, but certainly you seem to be implying or suggesting that there are certain shifts in the way... Um, given this kind of technological focus mm. that you suggested that there is a, um, a quote-unquote backlash against pristine illusionism of, of computer graphics and things like this, um, which perhaps precipitates a broader question or investment in craft, which then perhaps allows us to then recover? or I mean, So I'm just interested in whether there yeah. is a, a sort of shift here that we are now thinking about her in lots of new and, and, and exciting and interesting and, and, and unproblematic mm. ways. I think we can do, yeah, which is partly what I'm trying to do, although it's not just about, about Reiniger. Um, so I think there has been a shift. I think for a long time, craft has been hierarch hierarchically less valued than art. Um, and, and these are all really... I understand that I'm saying, you know, these are all really problematic uh, distinctions uh, and I'm kind of using broad strokes to, to talk about them, but that has been the case for quite a long time. And I think more recently, craft has had uh, a resurgence in terms of the sort of the cultural value that we attach to it. And we can see this commercially. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ever amused by, you know, the sort of increasing signs for craft beer down high streets. And if anyone's been past a Costa recently, there's, you know, signs for, you know, handcrafted coffee made in Costa, which, you know, is just ridiculous. Problematic. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to that term. Um, but so there's there's been a, a resurgence, and I, you know it's kind of it's kind of emblemized by um, you know stuff like Wallace and Gromit. We we love the idea that it's taken you know such a long time for something to be made, and that we can see thumbprints in it. Um, and th these are all really difficult distinctions because uh, you know if you talk to any animator, they will use craft-based handmade methods, and they will use digital methods, computers, you know, whatever, all kinds of software, etc. Um, and they will not necessarily see uh, value, um, a higher value attached to either of those processes. They, they use those processes in order to, to, to make what they want to make. Um, so I think these are quite, these are quite problematic sort of, uh, sort of assumptions about cultural value and what we do value. But I do think it's the case that lately this idea of craft and things being handmade has, has taken hold a little bit um, in, in culture across various kind of industries, actually. Uh, and, we're, and we're quite attached to this idea. Uh, and, it, and it is to do with kind of the authentic, problematically. Um, so, yes, I think we can recover Reiniger looking at, at those kind of issues. Um, I think what we can't do is rewrite history and, and what we can't ignore is that when her work has been released and when she's had anniversaries and, uh, and all these kinds of things, you know, all the stuff that's written about her is in those terms. It's about the pretty, it's about magic and it's about children's culture. Um, or it's about her being crafty, which is kind of the magic thing as well. She's, she's crafty in two ways. She's crafty because she hand makes her stuff and she's crafty because, you know, she's probably not skilled enough to actually have made these films, so she's somehow magicked them out of somewhere. Um, so I think we can't, we can't ignore that history, but what we can do is write about her different, differently now, um, and that is a way of reclaiming her in the canon, I think. So I guess as a final note of discussion before we open it up to, to questions, what, what could we say more about what we should be celebrating? I think we've said quite a lot about 
the ways in which um, her work is described that we would not agree with. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we could, you know, end on a note of, of positivity and talk yeah. about what, what is something we should value in her work that perhaps is often unvalued in it. That, I mean, we've talked a little bit about mm -hmm. a few things, but um, for me, the, the sense of... Um, well, the sense of the metamorphic, I think, which is such a powerful um, sort of... Uh, uh, force to get across in fantasy filmmaking and somehow with these sort of little paper um, puppets there's something so malleable and flexible about every single figure and every single form um, and that sort of odd paradox is so striking on screen so that's just one thing for me at least that I spotted on this viewing what uh, is there what else could we say that's um, that we should be saying about her work more I guess uh, yeah that's a really good point I think people have been so caught up with uh, the, the general aesthetic of her work, they actually haven't dug into the, uh, you know, yeah, like the, the a huge sort of amount of metamorphosis, which is kind of key to animation as well. Uh, there's, there's lots of that kind of uh, actual stuff about representation that hasn't really been covered uh, in her work. And, and, and yeah, I mean, your race question mark is, is there's, there's some problems clearly there as well. Um, so there's that. The other thing that hasn't properly been charted and which I am determined to do uh, is, is her development of, of the table uh, and the fact that, that Disney uh, pretty much replicated it 10 years later. So we do, we do have some sources that refer to that. I mentioned Chris's uh, source and also um, there are some, some uh, publications attached to German museums uh, that allude to... To, to this as well, but no one's properly charted that that kind of uh, technological development there. Um, so I think I think things like that could be properly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uncovered. Yeah, no, I, was, I think her connection. Because I was I was thinking about the technological aspects and where this comes within animation history, um, and also the point about the political. Because I know that you've written about and you gestured to this in your introduction actually that the film, because we perhaps become preoccupied with this, its aesthetic and its style and the fact that it's quite ornate and decorative, that that perhaps, or I don't know whether that veils a sort of, that this film is absolutely about the time that it's written rather than a distraction from it, which is obviously when we've done, we've talked about fantasy films previously, the role of allegory and metaphor and things like this. Um, so is it there, is there a, should we, re, should we be reading Reiniger in, in, in a kind of more political situated sense in the context of, of Weimar Germany, is that, is that a way in as well to push against a sort of surface level viewing of the decorative? Just to give you time to answer that, I just the other thing we've also talked about on this is the danger of reading alleg uh, fantasy allegorically and that it kind of strips, um, another problematic term, but strips the magic away a little bit, right? There's this, um, we talk about power relationships and reclaiming. Quite often people reclaim fantasy fiction by going, oh, don't worry, it isn't really a fantasy. It's actually a coded metaphor for something very deeply socially real. So actually it's okay. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a proper Legitimate, thing. Legitimate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's also a danger of sort of doing that um, to it. So I don't know what, what, where you would sit on that. Yeah, I, I find this this question quite hard to answer, and I mean, I grappled with it in the, my chapter for your book, as you know. Yeah, but we're recording um, this one. Yes, that's true. Uh, I think we can read the film metaphorically. I, I strongly suspect that's not was not her intention, actually, given the the rest of the body of her work. Um, you know, so you you can't really look at Reiniger's work as a whole, and given that she made films for a long time, um, with a 10-year gap when her husband died. Uh, you know, so we can chart her work through through most of her um, adult life, and 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 her thematic preoccupations are the same. So it'd be very it's very difficult to um, place her films within the kind of political and social context of, of the time, really. Um, I think we can take Esther Leslie's argument that the film is entirely to do with 1923, uh, if that's how we want to read it. But uh, I guess it comes down to a question of what's the, what importance we place on intent. Um, and, you know, the, the nice thing about fantasy, and I do take your point that uh, we have to be very careful about uh, you know, legitimizing fantasy by grounding it in some sense of the real. Um, that you know, there is there is also an argument that she made this film in 1923 because it would be, you know, cathartic and es an escapist, and uh, you know, um, and we can see that in other areas of the film industry throughout history. Um, 
so yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> um, uh, I wish that I could talk to her about it, but... Um, oh, that'd be great, yeah. Yeah. Um, fancy animation, we need a time machine. I'm not sure how we uh, create one of those. But yeah, absolutely, I think, I, think, I think perhaps we could also say that, you know, why, why can't we see catharsis as a political act? We somehow, you know, we are very hard on ourselves when we think about what, what counts as socially engaged activities. I think switching off or escaping or all these words that we often see as bad aesthetically are actually really important restorative... Um, activities that we need to sort of exist in society. So I think that's 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 true too. Should we? Um, we've yeah, got a roaming mic in the audience. Let's take some uh, some questions from um, if from people the audience. Have so questions. please do shoot your hand up or a comment or a uh, quest or yeah anything that you'd like to contribute. We'll uh, we can riff. We're we're good at that. Yeah. Sorry. If you could just wait for the microphone, otherwise uh, you won't get can your you starring me? role. Uh, can you hear and I'll me okay? have to repeat, yeah. yeah, we can hear. We got one at the back, and then we got one at the front uh, in a second. Yes. Long time listener, first time speaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think if you're looking for positive things to reclaim, what about the story? I mean, the story is really funny. It's really sexy. There's lots of action going on. Um, you know, as you've talked about at length and, and really intelligently, um, there's so much to say about the the look of it, the aesthetic of it. But I mean, the story is super tight. It's, it's kind of Michael Bay will be proud of this and the way it kind of moves from action to action to action. And, uh, and I don't think that's really part of the general conversation you know, that, that I encounter. It's always about that kind of the surface uh, discourse. So, yeah, I would say let's reclaim the story as well. Well, is the, I mean, I don't know whether this is, uh, this is true and you'll know more about the kind of process of it, but is that narrative economy rooted in the practice and the labor, i.e. certain kind of limitations, i.e. the figures impose a certain degree of limitation, so actually every move has to be precise and uh, loaded and be able to communicate certain actions quite quickly and quite economically. Uh, and so the, is, is the relatively short-ish running time connected to that, that sort of interplay between limitation and creativity? Is there something in that tightness of, of narrative? Yeah, so I think with any uh, film of this nature, and of course they're quite rare, um, you do have to be very... Um, uh, you have to plan ahead. So if you, if you see her... Uh, the way she planned stuff was really interesting because she would just make... She would just, it was like storyboarding, but she would, she would draw in the movements and, and, and the music as well. So she worked very much to music. So you get this very... Um, yeah, this very kind of tight storytelling. And the, the film is, is told in acts. Um, so if you watch it on YouTube, you can watch it in each uh, act. Uh, and it's, it's very structured, yeah. So, Chris, you're right. It's, it's, it's an interesting um, kind of take in, in storytelling and narrative. It's very tightly done. Um, and and she's, she was very talented at, at that, uh, even with her shorts. You know, the, the, the narrative is... Uh, they're always quite playful. There's always quite a lot of, you know, um, comedy in them uh, and yeah they kind of they kind of rock it along at a good at a good pace she was she was she was good at that but I think you're right a lot of that comes down to process and having to be very very uh, organized and uh, yeah I think I think it also speaks to its sort of folkloric and fairy tale nature fairy tales are incredibly economical because they need to be told um, out loud from memory um, you know uh, once upon a time in a faraway kingdom, there was a wicked queen and a, and a you know, handsome prince. You know, well, we've done characterization, we've done first act, and we haven't got to the end of the first sentence. I think J.R.R. Tolkien takes three chapters to explain how Frodo silts his house in order before he leaves the Shire. You know, um, uh, f folk stories get to the point because they're, they're there to be told and retold and remembered. So I think there's a certain element of that going on as well, which makes it such a sort of great thing for early animation to, to exploit because the story is, is so slight but so sort of rife for, um, for visualization at the same time. So great, great comment, thanks. On the, fr on the front oh, row we had a question, I think. Oh, on the front row we had a, row, uh, yeah. a question. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think the German issue is really important in terms of this film because, for example, what I, I found a number of things interesting. The race issue obviously is fascinating because the African sorcerer had a huge hooked nose. And he was always seen grabbing bags of money, which was very typical of Germany at the time uh, because the whole demonization of Jews and you look at the history of the Rothschilds, etc. cetera. Um, and the other point I was going to make was that I feel this is probably why she's been marginalized and buried 
to a greater extent because the Americans obviously, it wasn't in their interest, particularly at the time, to celebrate a German. So a lot of European things were buried at the time and misrepresented in order to promote the American perception of the victorious and the, yeah, the primary, really. The, 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 uh, would you agree with that? Um, possibly, although, I mean, quite a few German filmmakers did move to Hollywood um, yeah. during the, the 20s and the 30s, particularly in the 30s. So, um, I mean, lots of people cite uh, a film noir. But they were Americanized. They were perceived, um, the German directors and all those people were actually seen as American rather than German. Right. Although I suppose, but, but one of the features of film noir yeah. is obviously the expressionist, expressionist. lighting. So yes. what's weird is that there's that paradox going on. If you're saying that they're Americanized whilst yes. at the same time being celebrated for qualities in their film yes. that are being traced back to Germany. Yes. So they can't be perhaps fully ger Americanized if... Or maybe there's a slippage. By, by the general public, I mean. Right, sort right. Of Americanized, not, not in terms of the techniques they use, whereas she was very much German, perceived as German, if you see what I mean. Well, she, um, she left Germany um, with the rise of Nazism, but she, spent, yes. uh, she, she moved to Europe, so, yeah, she did spend quite a lot of time here. Uh, she spent time all around Europe and never, never really went back to Germany uh, to settle. She went back to visit her mum yes. um, when she was ill and dying, uh, but never really went back to settle there. Uh, she spent quite a lot of time in Canada doing workshops, uh, animation workshops there. Um, so I, I don't think I can speak to how she was seen uh, in that respect, but I think we do have to remember that she did leave Germany... Um, in protest uh, I, do, I do understand but yeah. a lot of amazing German artists mm. were actually tarred yeah. with the same brush at the time even though they did leave and they did rebel politically against the horror um, but they were seen as they were marginalised for being German and, and for being associated with and that yeah. potentially sort of therefore might have echoed into yes yeah interesting yeah, yeah. Not, not so much in England which as I said had you know you had the Mitfords and all sorts of connections which were very friendly to the Nazi regime but with the Americans that was seen as very very much verboten if you will and sort of not acceptable mm. yeah interesting so. thanks for the comment absolutely oh. hi thank you very much for playing the film I really enjoyed it um, I guess Maybe continuing from the first guy's comment uh, and in, with respect to what you were saying about how her uh, reputation is perhaps lessened by her being seen as like a, a, a craftsman rather than like an artist or some sort of tension between those two. But I actually personally think that that's a false tension because this film I thought was something of a masterpiece in visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I thought the visual storytelling was uh, massively down to the detail she put into and the beauty in which she created this amazing world. Uh, and so I feel like, if, I mean, I don't really know anything about this period of film or her as an author, but just from my experience with this film, you can clearly see that there's a fantastic relationship between her as a craftsman and then her ability to tell the story because essentially the story is driven by, by the amazing world she creates. And then one other thing which I perhaps want to add is you mentioned about her amazing use of, of metamorphosis between the characters and perhaps that was something which came out of her use of negative space because the characters were negative space then things can emerge from, from, from the darkness. Uh, and you mentioned that this negative space became maybe something of an anachronism because it was something which was pinned to children's storytelling and stuff like that. But, and again, it may be certain technologies die out and then, you know, because of the emergence of photography, et cetera, and color and blah, 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 then it got sort of buried, whereas actually maybe we just essentially lost an amazing craft. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. And maybe you could discuss her, her use of, of, of her craft to tell the story, because I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's a masterpiece as well. Um, so my, my whole work is, is around, you know, recovering that and, and, uh, and, and and, you know, the, the work that I've been doing recently is about craft and uh, how important it is uh, in, yeah, in terms of storytelling and, you know, this, this sort of amazing work that's out, that's, that's, that's out there. So it, I completely agree with you. It is a masterpiece and it's a very important film. Um, my argument is that um, 
that's not represented in how she's been written about in, uh, in either the trade press, critics' reviews, or in, in uh, film scholarly work. Uh, and that's, that's what my issue is with it. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, but that needs to be uh, represented in how we talk about these kinds of films. Yeah, I don't know where the mic. I have nothing insightful to add to that, but that was an yeah. insightful comment. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for a lovely film and a lovely evening. Um, I do have two questions. So the first question is, I was hoping, Caroline, you could speak more to her process and how she actually creates the cutouts. Because the entire time I was looking at some of the lace work and thinking, that's an X-Acto knife. She didn't have an X-Acto knife. What did she use to create? Because I, the only thing I can think of is like when you do a snowflake as a kid mm -hmm. and you, know, you fold it up, but then there's no creases. So it's just, I mean, I guess that speaks to how well she, she makes this, but also it's kind of magical. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, it is. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the first question. And the second question, too, would be, what are the odds that this would have any sort of influence on Walt Disney? Because in the music, I swore I heard just an echo of Elephants on Parade. So, like, that was an odd thing where I was like, no, wait a second, this isn't Dumbo. Um, so, yeah, just maybe we know this precedes Disney by a long shot. But again, like, would it have reached him in any sense? And, like, maybe to, like, what extent? if you guys could speak to any of that. Uh, thank you, yeah, they're really good questions. So what she um, did is she just had a series of tools, mostly t tiny scissors and, yeah, th those kinds of little uh, uh, knives. You can see them in um, uh, the uh, museum in Tübingen, which is a dedicated um, uh, permanent exhibition to Lottie Reiniger. So you can see her tools. Um, and if you look up, you can watch it on YouTube, um, I think, uh, how she did it is she she never moves the scissors she just moves the paper, so it's this it's a yeah it's a very skilled way of working and obviously it's very detailed and intricate but that is all she used is is a as a number of small scissors and, and knives and and a very kind of uh, incredible way of kind of being able to move her hands um, and the Disney thing is yeah it's a really good question um, so uh, so she. She obviously started making this film in 1923 and um, it took her three years to make it. And it was either shortly before that or during that time that she built the table. Um, and of course, there were many tables that, that she built over the years, which created this, these layers, um, which you can... I know it's a very flat 2D film, but you, there are moments where you can see those that kind of depth of field start to come through. Um, so, yeah, the, the only thing I can say is that I've, I found a note in an archive uh, that Walt Disney visited her in, uh, shortly after 1926, which would mean he probably saw the film and probably saw her table. Um, and didn't do anything with that information? No. <laughs> Crucially? Didn't copy it at all. Yeah. Forgot it entirely yeah. and then invented a remarkably cinema machine a few years later. I think the phrase deeply problematic is going to be used yeah. again in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so there is evidence in an archive. I, but I, it's, I, it's yeah. a note written yeah, by yeah. a family member on a letter and that's all we've got. And uh, uh, I'm still trying to um, uh, corroborate that. Uh, wow. Yeah, I know. Well. It, was a, it was a shivers down the spine moment, I can tell you. But yeah, so I, I think it's likely that either he... Um, I mean, he would have seen the film at some point. There was that, that's a good 10-year gap between... Uh, so, and it did have releases in America. So yeah, I'm sure he would have seen the film. It also seems likely that he did go to see her, and uh, in which case he would have seen the table, but I don't have much evidence of that other than a handwritten note from an archive. But whatever you say, uh, if you look at the... I mean, you know, Walt Disney's multiplane camera is, you know, incredible. But if you put the images next to each other, it's exactly the same design. And that might be coincidence. But I don't think it is. <laughs> but it might not I think be. we've got... Well, actually, I think we're two hands. Yeah, one here and one here. So we've got time for one more question. OK. Um, yeah. Why don't we take the final two and we'll see if we can sort of fold them into one omni answer, if that, that makes any <laughs> sense. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, one at the front and then a gentleman at the back, yeah. 
Um, well, thank you for the movie. I mean, it was wonderful um, to see it on like the screen here. So I guess kind of riding off of what we've been talking about, especially when it comes to coverage for Lottie Reiniger. Reiniger. Um, so how did the distribution of this film, uh, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, uh, compare to the distribution of Snow White? And has that influenced the way that this film, or these two films have been written in history at all, like on a national scale and on an international scale? Uh, yeah, so obviously uh, Reiniger's film had a much more limited release uh, then I don't know much about this. Chris will know more about it. So you will know more about this Snow White release. Um, yeah, that Chris will. The, the, yeah, both that Chris's one. That will one be there. able to talk about that. But, but but Ryan, for the benefit of those listeners at home in a few months, uh, they're both pointing at Chris Pallant, who is an academic sitting at the back, who answered the first question. I thought I'd be the voice of the listener at home going, who the hell are you talking about? And who is this Chris? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, yeah. I keep forgetting, and this is for a podcast. It's an audio media. Radio, radio. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, so the, the Reiniger release uh, was, uh, as you know, as we would see now with a, with a fairly independent film, it was a slow run. So it, it got released uh, in Germany um, to uh, a, a very small number of theatres and then was kind of rolled out. So it had a slow, long release, which is what we would see now, pretty much, with, with a film of, of that description, which means it kind of builds... Um, uh, word of mouth gets around and it builds a reputation that way, just like it would a film would on a, festi a film festival circuit. Uh, whereas, I mean, I don't know about Snow White. Did it have a big, big, big wide release? Pretty yeah. wide release, yeah. yeah. So it's your traditional box office hit versus a, a, you know, a smaller film festival kind of rollout. Although this is before the days of film festivals. Yeah. So she played for, sorry, she played very much to her own kind of artistic crowd initially and then it kind of got rolled out. And then we've got a quick, uh, time for the last quick question, which is just at the, just at the back. It's just a really quick question regarding um, shadow puppetry. Uh, we heard about a puppet show in um, southern Thailand, which we attended. It was the grandfather of the gentleman that actually showed us the show. And um, the, the, the kind of the, the whole of the the kind of range of, of kind of uh, figures uh, actually are almost a carbon copy of these Thai um, mystical creatures, which all seem to have a great deal of depth uh, within their own culture. And I just wondered if from Potsdam 23, you know, what sort of a relationship would the author have, if any, with Thailand? Um, with Thailand specifically, I don't know, but she was fascinated by shadow puppetry um, and wrote books about it, in fact. So she, from, from, uh, from a ch being a child, she would make her own shadow puppet theatres, which you're, you're absolutely right, you can see the influence of that um, in the film. Uh, and she was, you know, the fact that she based... Um, uh, this film on A Thousand and One Nights, she was very preoccupied with uh, Middle Eastern folklore and fairy tales and South Asian um, folklore as well. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's clearly a, a, a relationship there. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Um, as far as I know, she never visited um, uh, any of those regions, but it's, it's very clear... It's very clearly an influence in her work, and she writes about it as well as it's you know it's obvious in the in the visuals as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and thank you, uh, as I said, everybody for sticking around. Uh, please do join me in thanking Caroline for sharing her wonderful thoughts on Reiniger. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. That was. Yeah, welcome back. I, I I enjoyed it. Did yep. you, Chris? I liked the um, I liked the fact that we had some long time listeners first time kind of people involved uh, yes. who have listened to us um, over the last few months uh, and then kind of came along and, and wanted to be part of our kind of conversation as we took the discussion on, or well, Caroline as well, took the discussion on Reiniger um, from women um, to uh, her connections to, to Germany and, and German national identity. So we, we covered a lot in a short space of time. So I'm grateful for, to Caroline uh, and for the people that came along that, that um, engaged with the film, loved the film. I think it was well received when we watched it and people kind of clapping mm. along. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great movie and is rightly held up as this, this seminal landmark film within another.
Um, we do. We'll leave you with that. If you enjoyed listening to that and want to be part of live, um, part of the live conversations, that hear yourself having, on this podcast, asking contribute, a question, contribute, ask a question, get involved in the conversation um, physically in the room with us. We still have tickets left for all our screenings in 2020. Um, in a week or so, you can come watch Wizards, the Ralph Bakshi high fantasy movie. It's a bonkers classic. I really would recommend it. Um, tickets are selling well for that, but um, we could always have a few more people in the room. Then we've um, got uh, Dark Crystal, one of your. F- oh. So excited about Dark Crystal. February, um, remind me of the date? Uh, February the 20-something. Fe- February the 20-something. As he frantically looks at his yeah, diary, this yeah. will be cut out. I don't know if it will. Uh, I was right. It. Twenty. I was going to say, okay. February the 28th. February the 28th. Um, the Jim Henson puppet classic, come watch it. And maybe you've watched the new Netflix series and are now dripping in nostalgia. Come down, see it gloriously projected at the Cinema Museum and then listen to us um, and a special guest who is not quite confirmed yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be an exciting one. Um, and then at the end of March, so we'll be doing on Friday, the 27th of March, uh, we'll be doing actually a film that we've already done um, on, the, on the podcast. So do listen to the podcast and come along. Um, and that is Yellow Submarine, where we have a, a special guest, uh, Jing An Young, playwright, um, academic, who will come and talk to us about the 60s context out of which Yellow Submarine emerged. So if you're interested in fantasy animation, you're interested in us um, chatter about all things um, animated fantasy, do come along to the Cinema Museum throughout January, February and March. Uh, and we'd love to see some of these will be released as live episodes later on in the year but not not yet so come down and listen to them live um, and take part tickets are available on the cinema museum website that's cinemamuseum.org.uk um, click on the events tab and you'll be able to find us on that or you can visit uh, the fancy animation website uh, and there's a particular tab the cinema museum series click on that and it gives you all the information about the films that we've already screened um, films that we're going to screen uh, and links where you can buy tickets. And what is that website, Chris? That is fantasy-animation.org. Great. You can find us there. You can find us on Twitter at fananimresearch, F-A-N-A-N-I-M research, um, as well as on Facebook and on our Phantom Instagram account that doesn't exist yet, but keep saying it. It might appear. Um, it's like Peter Pan. Clap your hands if you believe in Instagram. <laughs> Um, we will become modern and trendy we promise Um, at some point speak Um, for yourself um, give us a like uh, subscribe on your various podcast feeds Um, give us a quick review if you can and a star rating all of this helps um, find a friend who you don't like quite as much as the rest of them and make them download the podcast and listen to it Um, all of it really helps um, help those numbers keep growing thanks very much Uh, we've been Fantasy Animation bye